Let's take our seats. We've been working through the book of Revelation. It's a lot to chew on, a lot of information to, to bring to you. And before we go there, I'm going to be doing a little bit of a, I guess a recap of the first five chapters just to bring you up to, up to speed and what, what, where we're at and what we've been doing. And just as a reminder, so we, we know what's going on. So before we do this, let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Lord, you are so good. And Lord, this, this word of yours is so true and it's so alive. So I ask God that you would make yourself real to us today in your word, that you would teach us what you want us to know, that you would override me if I go off track, and that you would have said what you want said today and taught what you want taught. May your truth prevail over all things. In Jesus' name, amen. So the book of Revelation has been a book that people don't usually want to read because they can't get through it. It's, it's a tough book. And the question is why would God give us this book? What would be the reason that God would give us this book? Because it's filled with so many things that seem so devastating and we can't even understand half of it. But the fact is that God gave us this book because he loves us. And he wants us to know and he wants us to dig. He doesn't want us just to lightly read this book. He wants us to dig into it. He wants us to know the scriptures. He wants us to understand what was said in the Old Testament to bring to the new. And he wants us to understand that this is future stuff. And I fully believe that, that the seals, the scrolls that, were sealed, that Daniel had, that were sealed up until the end of days, I believe that we are understanding them in the book of Revelation. And there's so many references to Daniel in the book of Revelation. And so I, I believe that God wants us to know and I've had people say to me, don't teach this, it's too scary. And I'm telling people, look, you know, you wanna know what's going on. You, you need to know what's going on. If, if a road is out, you need to know the road is out. There's nothing worse than being in a hurry and going down a road and there's no signage to say that the road is out and then to find out that you've hit something because the road was out. I personally know somebody who did that. They actually had a, a night shift in the middle of the night. They were traveling home, and there were no signs that there was this huge hole in the road. I don't know what happened. I don't know if people took it away. I don't know what went on, but he was going, and he hit this pothole, this huge hole, and his, it broke the tie rod in the front, uh, spun the car around, smacked it into a fence, busted a fence, um, it could have killed him. And the problem was that there was no signage. It was dark and there was nothing. And yet when it comes to the future, people often say they don't want to know. It's too scary. I don't want you to tell me. La, 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 la. But we have to know. This is, this is why we need to know. Because if there's danger coming, if there's things that are going to happen, we need to know what they are. We need to be prepared for it. We need to know what we have to do. Whether it's to go around something, whether it's to go slower, whether it's to, you know, whatever it is. We need to know. And that is why we have the book of Revelation. The word Revelation in the Greek is apocalypsis. And if you think of the word apocalypse, that's it. And usually when you hear apocalyptic things happening, you think of disasters. You think of monument momentous and monumental destructions. But that's not what it means. Apocalypsis is revelation. And revelation is a revealing, an uncovering, opening up something that was a mystery before or something we didn't understand before. It is allowing us to see something hidden. The book is prophetic. 
written to tell the future in the days just before Jesus returns, all the destructions that will happen. It's been a mystery to the ages, but it's opening up and making sense to us now. It was written by John the Apostle, dictated to him by an angel and by Jesus. The Apostle John was taken the Spirit to heaven and he saw the things that are going to happen. He witnessed the things in the future. Symbols were given, signs that will be and are even now, events that will all eventually happen. And as we go into these chapters, you will see the foundations of all of this happening. And it has been there a long time. People say, oh, you know, we've always had disasters. We've always had this, we've always had that. And that's true, that's true. Um, there's always been the spirit of Antichrist, and we'll go into that a little bit today too. Hitler was a, had a spirit of Antichrist. I fully believe the man was possessed by the devil himself. But, but, the spirit of Antichrist will be upon the Antichrist. We'll see the foundation of these things happening now in these days' events. The book starts with John being told to write what he's seen, what he sees, and what will be. The letter is dictated to give to seven churches that exist in that day. And there were many churches. And if you were here during that one, good. You'll know that we represent the churches as well. If you weren't, if you missed the two messages on the church with your name on it, you can find it on our website. Chapters 4 and 5 are the preparation in heaven before the tribulation seals are opened. And chapter 6 um, is in the same um, video that, we, that you would see if you were missing it. It's called Glimpse of Heaven. So the first seal in chapter 6, we actually got through the first one. But I want to go back a little bit and cover it a little bit deeper. Because in chapter 6, is the start of the tribulation. It rolls out the first of the judgments of God against the world. And Jesus himself is opening the scroll. And it's a legal document. Some say it's the inheritance of the saints. Some say it's a deed to the earth that was given up to the devil when Adam and Eve um, ate the fruit. But whatever it is, it's a legal document. It's a scroll and it has seven seals on it. And each one of these seals is opened up by the Lamb of God, Jesus. And what's going to happen is disasters are going to happen. I believe it's not the wrath of God for the first three and a half years. I believe that Satan himself is going to thrash because he knows the end's coming. For three and a half years, it's going to be horrible. But God promises to pull his people out. I've talked about that before. It's called the catching way. I won't go into a lot of that. But in case you have the question or have had the question, why us? Why would we be taken out of this? Why would we be the Philadelphian church to escape such trouble and trial when so many people around the world for centuries have suffered persecution? It's because it's not God doing it. It was man doing it. This wrath of God that comes upon the earth is going to be God's wrath. That's different than the persecutions that people have suffered and which we might as well. When God's wrath hit the earth once before, he took the only eight people that believed in him out into a boat and he saved them from a flood. When he hit the city of Sodom and area with fire, that was his wrath upon people that were being evil and violent and horrible. And he took the family, the only family that truly trusted him and followed him, took them out. And on the day that he decides, the father decides to tell Jesus to come get us, he will call us to us, him, all of us will go who believe in him, who are looking for him. It'll be done on a grand scale. So, before that happens, and hopefully, because there's so many different, um, different interpretations of how this is going to play out, scholars, theologians, who have a lot more time and a lot more education than I do, are still arguing over how this plays out. Does Jesus call us to him before the tribulation starts? 
Does he call us to him in the middle, before the wrath? Does he call us to him at the end? But I believe that we need to be ready for him at any time because we don't know. I'm hoping for the pre. I'm hoping we're out of here before this all breaks loose. But if we aren't, then we need to make sure our faith is strong. And the worst that could happen if our faith is strong is that we have faith strong when we get to heaven. The best that could happen is that if we do go through some of this, that we have faith strong enough to withstand it. Now, there will be a falling away. Persecution is rising and it will continue to rise. And the Bible says that a lot of Christians will leave the faith. Let that not be us. The Antichrist will rise. I don't know who he is. Nobody knows who he is, but he will make himself known and he will be used by Satan. And I believe fully that he'll be possessed by Satan. He'll be Satan's man. He's described by various titles in the Bible. He's described as the Antichrist in 1 John 2.18, 2.22, 4.3, 2 John 7. He's described as the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 to 4, man of lawlessness as well, depending on the translation. Um, the beast, Revelation 13, 5 to 8, the little horn, Daniel 7, 8 and 8, 9, the false Christ, Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21. The prince who is to come, John 14, the Assyrian, interestingly, Isaiah 10 and Micah 5. And he'll have a spirit of Antichrist on him. And and he will be the man, not just one of them that have come through the thousands of years before Christ and after Christ. Spirit of Antichrist will be upon him and in him. His number will be the number, his name will be the number 666. And people have tried for so long to figure out whose number is 666. And they've, just, they've named off all sorts of people, but we, we don't know. And people have come and gone. Um, people back in the day of the early church, they thought it was Caesar. His name was 666. It worked out, but it wasn't. But in John 2, 15 to 17, it says this number 666. And this represents man. And the reason the number 6 represents man is because man was created on the sixth day. It's, it's a number that is one off of perfection. God's perfection number is 7. Man is 6. And because it's 666, it's like the Trinity, only the evil part. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then you've got the Antichrist and the prophet and the beast. Satan himself. So those three, the unholy trinity. And he is going to be a man, so the six, triple. Now the Bible is filled with details on the future world and this future leader. He will be a world leader and never before in time have we had such networking that we could have a world leader. We've never had that. People have been the world leader of their time, but we actually have the ability to have a world leader now. He's called a genius. This is what he's like. We've got to keep our eyes open for this guy. A genius, Revelation 13 and Daniel 7. He'll perform miracles. So he is going to take the place of Christ. He's going to do what he can. Antichrist, Antichrist is to, to replace Christ not only against him, but to replace him. And so he's going to perform miracles, signs and wonders. Revelation 13 and 2 Thessalonians 2. He's going to be a compelling speaker. He's going to be very charismatic. And I was listening to something recently about voice and those who have had an antichrist spirit oftentimes lead people into evil, not because of the words they say, but how they're saying it. You know, and I was thinking about it yesterday, too, that there are some songs, they're really, really catchy, but the words are horrible. And I've heard people singing these songs, and I say, do you know what you're singing? No, but I just love the tune. Like, think about what you're saying. And this is what happens. He's going to compel people through what he's saying, but not the words he's saying as much, though he will get into them, and they will buy into what he's saying, but they will be drawn to him because he's so charismatic. 
He'll be a deceitful politician, Daniel 9, Revelation 17, 13 and 17. He'll be distinct and fierce in his physical appearance. He's going to be imposing. He's going to have a fierce face. He'll be a military genius, Revelation 4, 17, 19. He will be an economic, he'll be an economic controller. He will definitely take over all the economies and uh, the systems, financial systems, Revelation 13. He'll be a blasphemer of God, Revelation 13. He persecutes believers in God, and he does it in a way that is, is more brutal than has ever been done. And if you ever look at history and how some of the persecutions happened, um, it's disgusting, it's horrible, it's painful to even read, and this guy's gonna be even worse. Daniel 7, 25, Matthew 2, 24, Revelation 13, 7. He'll be utterly lawless, 2 Thessalonians 2. He will be a narcissist, evil controller, Daniel 11, 37, 2 Thessalonians. Money hungry, Daniel 11, 38. He will not desire women, interesting. He will not follow the God of his fathers, so whatever his background would have been, he will not follow it, and he will not follow the desire of women. He will not be interested in that. Daniel 11. He has a God complex. He will stand in a place, the temple at one point, and he will call himself God. He will demand to be worshipped as God, and anybody who does not worship him will be killed. Daniel 11, 2 Thessalonians 2. He's not fully human. He starts out as human, but he's transformed. And we have to remember that in Daniel 7, he's not really understanding how is that possible that somebody's transformed from human into non-human. But nowadays we do know how that can happen. We do know the integration, and we've looked that up too in in Daniel, uh, where we have read that that even the statue was a mixture of metal and clay. We see how AI is coming into human bodies. We're seeing how um, Elon is actually putting these things into people to, for the good cause, right? Good cause, help them see, help them hear, help them walk. But it will be used for nefarious reasons in the future. And there's something called CRISPR now, which dabbles with the DNA. We've got these things in place that have never been before. This man is going to be transformed to be greater than others. He will not be fully human. He will survive a mortal head wound. Uh, I'm not sure how that goes. It says Daniel 8 and Revelation 13. And there's some speculation that maybe it's a nation that he's representing, but most scholars believe that he will survive something and be brought back to life. He will have global, worldwide authority given to him. Revelation 13. And he will fight Jesus. Revelation 19. And we're going to get into that as we go through the book of Revelation. But that's what he is. That's who he is. That's what he's going to do. He will come out of a confederation of ten countries or kingdoms. Daniel 7, 24. The system he established will control, trample, and crush the whole earth. He's not a very nice guy. Daniel 7. He will be judged on the last day by God. So the good guy wins. God will, will judge him on the last day and he'll be thrown into a lake of fire. Revelation 19, 19 to 21. So this, this isn't even everything. I'm giving you a snapshot of what this guy's going to be like, what he's called, we don't know his name, but you will recognize him. You will not be deceived by him if we are still here when he comes on the scene. And I fully believe he's in the background controlling some things right now. Just the way things are going, just the way things are happening. I believe he's there and he's doing something, pulling strings, putting leaders in their places, getting things ready because honestly, he'll have seven years to rule and he has to have it set up before he gets there. He can't start setting it up in the seven years. He's got to have it set in before the seven years. And I believe that foundation is now, it's, it's just about ready. 
He's going to do a lot of damage. He's going to devastate the Jewish people. He will destroy without warning. In Daniel chapter 8, Angel Gabriel comes to Daniel and he explains to him what's going to happen. And he explains what's going to happen in the last three and a half years of those seven. And he, he tells us through Daniel that tribulation is the judgment of God upon the earth. It says in Daniel 9, 27, the ruler will make a treaty. Now, the Antichrist. He's going to make a treaty or a contract or a pact. Watch for it. Watch for a treaty that's going to be with the people for a period of one set of seven. So that meaning, that's meaning seven years. He's, he's going to make a pact. So if this is something that's going on now, it's a group of nations, and they make agreement with many nations for seven years. But after half this time, he'll put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. As a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. So the other thing is that the third temple, the third temple will be built, and it's about ready to go. They've got everything in place. They just need the word, and they will start building. They can't yet. But that agreement will be seven years. Because it says, once that temple is built, put it all together, and they're waiting for their Messiah, who I believe will be who they think is the Antichrist, their Messiah. They're going to be mistaken. But halfway through that seven years, this guy stops the sacrifices, stops the worship, says, you're not worshiping your God anymore. You're going to worship me. And he's going to walk into the temple and he's going to set up an image, maybe a hologram even of himself, making sure that's there all the time. People have to worship him. Now, Mark 13, 14 says, so when you see the abomination of desolation, it's Jesus speaking, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not. Let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. What, what Daniel um, actually had predicted, which, which actually happened, was a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, and he, he hated the Jewish people so much, and he went into their second, it was their second temple, and he, yeah, I think it was the second temple, but he went in there and he slaughtered a pig on the altar. And a pig is a very unclean animal. He desecrated the temple. And that was huge for the Jewish people. It was huge. And, and so this guy is going to do a similar thing. He's going to turn around and come into the temple and set up something that's an abomination. Maybe it'll be another pig on the altar, but it also says he sets up an image. This image comes to life. No time in history have we ever had an image come to life. But now, in our lifetime, and perhaps it is a hologram, Revelation 13, 15 says, it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of this beast could even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 11 says that he'll use miracles and deceptive power to convince people to follow him, deceiving people to believe in him and do evil because he tells them to. Jesus warns us of deception in these last days in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. So this is what the first seal is opening up for us. When we see and read that this rider of a white horse is on the scene, that's who the rider is. That's what we're looking at. He's not just some guy on a horse. It's the Antichrist. This is the guy that's coming. And he's got a bow. He's, he's riding a white horse, deception. He, he has uh, control without any arrows. He will not create this war to control the people. The Holy Spirit will be moved out of the way, giving the Antichrist the freedom to be revealed to do what he's going to do. 2 Thessalonians 2, 5 to 12 says, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what's holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. 
for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and be, so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth and have delighted in wickedness. It's pretty clear. He's going to deceive the masses. And we love the truth, and so we will not be deceived. He is going to, he's going to be brutal, but a lot of people will love his, his ways, and they will believe his ways. And then Jesus broke the second seal, as if it wasn't enough. And, and I do believe that we can see some of this stuff happening now. I, I really believe that, that the deception and the wickedness has already started um, to escalate. But the second seal, when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. And another, a red horse went out, and to him who sat on it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that people would kill one another, and a large sword was given to him. And so this, this Greek word, peace is irene it it isn't just peace as we see it where there's peace on the earth it's peace of mind that's the kind of peace that he takes this rider takes everybody is anxious everybody's confused nobody's settled everybody's wondering what's going on um, there's a lot of fear a lot of anxiety a lot of chaos and and, and a lot of um, I believe some mental health, a lot more mental health issues. As people are feeling the instability, it's affecting them in the way they're processing. It is a loss of peace of mind. There'll be discontent, anger, violence, wars, deadly conflict, and the use of a large sword or knife. And I thought that was interesting that that was put in there. And we're seeing a lot more violence with knives. You, 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 have to, you have to see that in the news. Um, in Canada, Stats Canada, 2023, stabbing, stabbing deaths were second in the, in the homicide list of, of ways of killing. The first was, was shooting. The second was stabbing. And it's rising. We can see it happening. And it's going to take great faith to keep our peace of mind and not be afraid. If we know it's coming, we need to get our faith really strong. When, when somebody's going to go into a competition of some sort, they don't walk into the competition expecting they're gonna be able to win whatever it is that they're competing for. They beforehand are spending many months, maybe years, getting ready, getting stronger, getting their muscles stronger. And, and we too need to do that with our faith. Faith is like a muscle. We need to really stretch our faith. We need to stop relying as much on ourself, relying on others, which we should rely on others. But, but the thing is we forget that we need God and we need to trust him through everything. And that's the biggest challenge is trusting him through the things that we go through and understanding that we're learning something. We're growing in this, and God's going to use that to help us understand that he is in control. We have to start now. If we wait until we see these signs, if we wait until this Antichrist appears on the scene and we actually know his name, it's too late. Fear is going to rise. We're going to panic, we're going to run, we're going to, to bend to whatever he wants even if we don't want to because we're so scared. We see him, we don't see God. We see what he's doing, we don't see what God's doing. We forget that God's telling us this ahead of time to prepare us, not to say, hey, it's gonna happen, just walk into it. He's saying, prepare, I want you strong, I want your faith strong.
Jesus breaks the third seal. It says, when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, come, I looked and behold a black horse and the one who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand and I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine. So this is the economic crash. This is famine coming out of an economic crash. And, and if you look at how much a denarius was worth, it was a, pay, a day's wages. And so if you look at it for Canada, for the average day's wages, it would be like $150 for a liter sized container of wheat. So if you, if you buy flour and you buy a liter of it, you have to pay $150. That's kind of extravagant. Three days wages for three quarts of barley the rich will continue in luxury and the rest of the world will be going into poverty and starving. And so I would encourage us to do what Joseph did in Genesis 41. And I believe everything's in the Bible for a reason. Joseph knew there was going to be famine for seven years. And he told the Pharaoh that. And so Pharaoh put him in charge of gaining food, putting away food for the seven years so that when the famine came, they had food. And I believe that we can prepare a bit. And if you can put away some food, even the states are saying put away food in case there's some kind of grid crash or something. Put away for like three weeks or something, three weeks worth, if you can. I would do it. I mean, it's in here for a reason. It's going to get hard. And if we're gone before all this happens, You've saved it for somebody who may need it. The fourth seal is opened by Jesus. The lamb broke the fourth seal. I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come, I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and the one who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him. Authority was given to him over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword and famine and plague and by the wild animals of the earth. The opening of the fourth seal reveals a pale horse, its rider named Death with Hades following behind. So this is what's happening. Humanity is going to suffer horrible things. There's going to be a lot of death. It's going to come from sword, that one that was mentioned, fighting. We see so many, so many things, so much, so much violence, even in you know, schools and in malls and stadiums, just people going crazy with knives and guns. People will be killed by the sword, by famine, by plagues, and even wild animals. And, and a few years ago, I did a study, and I, I wanted to know what the stats were for animal attacks. And so I'd look up a certain animal, and I'd look up the stats. And I was shocked to find that, that the increase of violent attacks of animals against people, killing or injuring them, has increased steadily over the years. And over 10 years, it is... It is crazy. And I believe that animals are sensing the earth shifting. I, I, say, I think that the animals are starting to respond and they're reacting. But however it is, whether they kill because they are reacting or whether they kill because they, they're poisoned themselves and people are eating them, a fourth of the earth will be killed and destroyed. The fifth seal is broken by Jesus. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been killed because of the Lord, word of God and because of the testimony which they maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who live on the earth? And a white robe was given to each of them and they were told that they were to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters who were to be killed even as they had been was completed also. This is persecution. And this is happening now. And there are souls under the altar in heaven crying out to God even now. But they will cry out when this seal's opened. All of them. It will be a bloodbath. How strong are we? I was listening to some, some missionaries um, 
who put out a prayer request, if you follow any of the uh, martyrs, papers, the ones that follow those missionaries or people living in different places of the world that are, are living for Christ and, and they're in a place that's dangerous. I've heard their prayers. They say, we need you to pray for us, not that we get out of this, but that we are strong through it. Wow. Here we pray, help us escape all of this. Everything we go through, take it away. I don't want it. Make it not happen, make it go away. What we're saying is, we don't want to experience anything to grow. We don't want to experience anything that tests our faith. We need to. We need to strengthen our, our faith muscle. We need to be strong in the Lord. And the things that are coming to us now are nothing to the things that will be coming to those who will be here at that time. And we need to get our faith stronger in case that's us. So every time something doesn't go our way, we need to think, what am I learning? Really, what am I learning? Can I grow stronger in this? We must be strong in the Lord. The sixth seal is opened. I look, when we broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. And the kings of the earth and the eminent people and the commanders and the wealthy and the strong and every slave and every free person hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and for the wrath of the lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Brutal. Matthew 27, 50 to 52, states that when Jesus died on the cross, a great earthquake happened. And in Matthew 28, 2, there's a record of another earthquake when Jesus rose from the dead. This great earthquake is going to be a signal that the great tribulation is about to begin. We have reached the three, three and a half years into the seven years now. And there's going to be a huge sign huge earthquake and not only a huge earthquake there is a description here that is really really interesting the sun becomes black and the moon becomes red and the stars of the sky fall to the earth and the sky split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up and everything's moved from its place and what's interesting is that, again, a few years ago I was reading this and, and somehow the information seems to be disappearing, but there has been question as to when the pole shift is going to flip the poles of this earth. And it happened year, thousands of years ago. And they're waiting for it to happen again. The poles are moving. The North Pole is moving towards Russia. It was in Canada. It's moving towards Russia, and it's moving very quickly now. It's actually increasing in speed. And at some point, it will tip. And when it tips, we have a pole shift. We have a pole flip. And would that not make sense? That it would look like the sky split apart, like a scroll being rolled up. Uh, on Google, there was recently, just the other day, a depiction of what it's going to sound like when that pole flips. It's interesting. And it, it's a horrible sound because it's very electrical and it's, it's got a lot of um, the, the sound that is going to come out apparently according to what they believe because everything's moving. It's going to almost sound like a, a boat that's creaking and ready to, it's breaking apart maybe. Um, it's, there's the electrical sounds, there's, there's a, almost a sound like a howling. It's almost like the earth is crying out. And this is what happens as we enter into the last three and a half years. The seal brings changes in the sun, moon, and stars. Jesus warned about it in Luke 21, 25. The sun turns black, moon turns red. Meteors fall to the earth. The sky recedes. 
And people recognize this is it. And they hide. The wrath of God's come. It's funny, they don't call out to God though. They call out to the mountains. Hide us. They believe in rocks. People now believe in rocks. Crystals, different things for good luck. It's interesting. Revelation 7 is a pause between six and seven seals. It reveals God's cosmic plan, providing a moment of hope and comfort in the middle of the chaos. And what we see, and I won't read it, but after the four angels are sent, the four corners of the earth, they hold back four, the four winds. So nothing, no wind blows on the earth. And there's an angel that goes out and calls out, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we've sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And there's 144,000 Jewish people that will be called out and protected by God. 12,000 from every tribe. And after that, what did John see? He saw a great multitude in heaven. He couldn't count them. Every nation, every tribe, every people, every language standing before the throne of God and the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches were in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might belong to our God forever and ever Amen. And John wonders, like, who are these people? Who are all these people? And one of the elders said, these who are clothed in white robes, who are they, he said. And he said, my Lord, you know. And he said, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They've washed the robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will no longer hunger nor thirst, nor will the sun be down on them, nor any scorching heat. The lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd, will guide them, springs of the water of life. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. At the earth's four corners, four angels hold back the four winds, preventing any harm from coming to the earth or the sea. So what's happening here is is John seeing us there. He's seeing all of us who have come through whatever part we've come through up to that point, to that three and a half years of that wrath of God. Rapture's happened, and everybody's up there. And you know what's cool? You're there. You're already there. He saw you. You believe in Jesus, you're there already. It's the coolest thing. If you don't believe in Jesus, it's a matter of getting right now. It's a matter of, of not waiting. There's no time to wait. Asking Jesus into your life is the way to get to heaven. It's a way to make sure your face is one that, that John saw. And then in verses 15 to 17, we just see the lamb is going to protect his people and there's not gonna be any more tears. Everything that we've ever been through, he's going to, to comfort us and take away that pain. The seventh seal is open in chapter 8, and when the seventh seal is open, there is silence in heaven for half an hour. I saw seven angels stand before God. Seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood before the altar, and he has given much incense to offer. This incense is the prayers of the saints. It's an offering to God. Every time we pray, it's like incense to God. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it to the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumbles, flashes of lightning and an earthquake. God hears our cries and he will hear our cries and the cries of those who are here during this time. And he hears. He's going to do something, and he's going to make things right. And he's not happy at what's happening to his people. So the judgment that leads up to the close of tribulation 
is now visible in the scroll. It's so severe that a hush falls upon all in heaven for what John calculates as a half hour. And I think that half hour represents the half of the tribulation. I believe that that hour that comes upon the earth is the hour that is spoken of here and now we've got half of it done. Jesus has opened the seals. It's time for the trumpet judgments to begin. We're in the last three and a half years. Remembering that God doesn't want his people to go through this should encourage us. At some point, he will get us out of here. And those last three and a half years of wrath, we're not supposed to be there for that. Some people will turn to Christ during that time, and they will suffer for it. But up until that point, we have every opportunity to tell people about Christ. We have every opportunity to get strong in our faith and just be strong together as a community. We'll need that. That's what the early church did too. We're going to look at um, the trumpet judgments next week. But I want to remind you, this isn't to scare us. Scared, fearful, that's not going to help you anyway. Being afraid of something that's going to happen is not going to help you. It just makes things worse. But if you're aware of what's going to happen and you start getting stronger and you're aware of what to look for and how to prepare, you have control. You have some control over this, over yourself, how you handle it, and your trust in God. So I don't want anybody afraid of what's going on. This is going to happen, and we might as well just get hunkered down and get ready for it, however far we go in. And hopefully, we'll be out of here before it gets really bad. But that leaves people behind, and so we really need to take this time to bring people towards Jesus. Give them the hope, because as they see things going crazy, as they see the world acting out of order, everything's confusing, we wonder what's happening? Why is it like this? We have the answers why it is. We need to tell them. We have to stop being quiet. We need to bring people into the understanding and give them the hope through this because the fear and the terror is going to be beyond anything we've ever seen. We need to be the ones to bring the peace. We need to be the run ones to bring that hope and that compassion and that love and that feeling of safety. It's okay. God's got this. Amen? All right. Well, let's pray. Lord, that was a lot on the plate today. It's been a long time going through this, but Lord, I know that we need to, we need to understand and we need to dig deep and and we need to fully take in what it is you're telling us. And there's a lot. And so I pray that as we leave this place today, as we digest what you've given us, that you would help us to feel excited when we see things starting to happen because we know you're coming back soon. This will all be over soon. Lord, help us to grow strong in you. Help us to get right before you. Help us to let go of the things that are holding us back from being close to you. If we have anything in our life that's been controlling us that we know you're not wanting us to do, help us to hand that to you and be free of it. If we have grudges or, or anything that's been holding us back, bitterness and unforgiveness, help us, Lord, convict us in our whole heart, our soul, to hand that over to you and to love, to love as you love. Help us get ready. Help us to be prepared. Help us to look to you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.